Well, Udo, welcome back to the SAT Studios. It's good to have you back. And since last time, uh, I think we've already released your session that we recorded on determinism on uh, Facebook and also uh, we shared it on YouTube. Um, and you're back this time to speak to us about the extent of the atonement, which is uh, obviously something that we naturally should progress to once we look at the question of determinism. Obviously, the next logical question to ask is, okay, but then uh, are some determined to believe and others not? And, and how does that affect the effic uh, efficacious grace of God and, and how we perceive his extent of um, seriously saving people and bringing them to himself. So welcome back to the SAT Studios. Thank you very much. I'm glad uh, to be back. <laughs> it's always good to, to speak about the things of God and we can maybe start off by just saying that there are uh, quite a few perspectives concerning the extent of the atonement. Some people obviously believe that God uh, only died for an elect few, which is determinative, uh, you know, to their confession of faith. Others believe that it's only for those that are baptized as infants. But today we're going to speak about the extent of atonement that is available to all. And maybe we should start off the question, what does it mean when we speak about atonement? Um, I know some people uh, that might listen to this conversation might not know where we're coming from. So maybe you want to start there. Yeah, I think uh, <coughs> to make it very simple is just to say that uh, the atonement is the process um, of, of the removal of, of the obstacles um, in our reconciliation with God. So it's a, it's a relational term. Mm. Um, and I think one can also talk in terms of of, um, of being saved, but then it's being saved from sin. So then you would say that, that the atonement is, is, is the satisfaction for sins um, that, that Christ um, did by dying for us on the cross. Well, and just to, to start off and throw into the deep end with this conversation, a lot of people would say, Yes, but when we look like at scriptures like if, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, 25, it says that Christ died for the church, which is obviously showing that there is a limited context to the atonement. And then in John 10, we can see that Jesus is only calling his sheep. Um, and therefore, when we look at these passages, it seems like uh, the offer of salvation only comes to some, uh, but not to others. What would you say about that? Well, I think, I think <laughs> scripture is... is pretty clear that the offer comes to all people so I think I think and we can I mean we can we, we will talk about those uh, passages or scripture or, or, or reference them but um, when 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 scripture mentions you know certain groups of people like um, sheep or you know any or the church or, or any group of people I mean the scripture also mentions where Paul talks about um, you know Christ made atonement for me, or to that mm, effect. Mm. So one individual, yeah. and he mentions that in, a, in, in that context. So does that mean it's only for, for Paul that, that Christ died? Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when I like to use the analogy of, of when, I, um, when, I, when I say I intend for people to eat the ice cream that I bought them, um, then it doesn't mean that um, only the people that, that do in fact eat the ice cream, um, you know, are the people that I bought it for. No, the, the, the wider group is the people I bought it for, but of course only certain people would eat it and w want to eat it. Um, so those passages that, that talk, talk about, you know, the sheep or the church, it's from that perspective, you know. Mm -hmm. um, of course, when you are saved and, and um, you recognize what Christ did for you, then it is true that Christ died for you as a collective group who believe the same thing. So mm. I, I don't see a problem. Yeah, and from a libertarian perspective, they would say, well, no, it's only for the elect. Otherwise, some of Christ's blood would be wasted. But I think the greater concern is, as we spoke about this previously as well, <coughs> is, is that a statement that God would save only some when it's in his power to save everyone, um, would impugn upon the character of God. Again, we're back to the character of God. Yeah. And also the extent of God's love is yeah. impacted. Uh, what would you say about, you know, the libertarian's perspective and how it impugns upon the character of God? Yeah, I, I really do think it impugns the character of God. Um, <coughs> and if I have to take seriously passages that says that God desires all people to be saved, mm. then it makes sense to say that, yes, um, you know, you're talking about uh, um, Christ's blood being wasted if, if, if some people are not saved. I think that's, that's you know, um, um, a different way of looking at it is, is to say that 
uh, to say that if God desires all people to be saved, then it must mean that 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 he died for all for all people because if he didn't then he only died for some then and only those small group of people can believe then you know then then it's not true that he died that he desires all people to be saved um so there's no there's no blood wasted mm. there's just that's the extent of god's love it it um it risks it, it, if you can use the word risk, because God knows, I, I, I think He foreknows who will be saved. But um, it covers all people, even if some don't believe. And I think the question we can also ponder is Acts chapter ten thirty four. Well, in that sermon, we see that the mention is made that God shows no partiality. Right. But if we hold on to this limited perspective, there is a form of partiality which we actually uh, direct towards God. Uh, and that's not what we believe. We do not believe that God is partial towards individuals. No, we don't. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is, is when you read passages like John 1, 29, 31, John 3, 16, which is a very popular yeah. passage of Scripture, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 to 6, uh, we cannot shackle those Scriptures, even lexically, with the understanding that God is a limited God in His scope towards salvation. Um, maybe... Um, for the listeners out there, maybe we should explain to them what we mean when people say that God has only saved the elect. How would you define from the other perspective what it means when they speak about the elect? Um, well, now this, this goes to a different subject, um, you know, in, in the scheme of, of su mm. soteriology, um, asking who the elect is. But I, I believe that the elect is, is all those... Um, that are in Christ when they believe. Mm. Those are the elect that um, uh, that that God knows about. It's a it's a group of people that are in Christ. Um, and now the question is, how do you how do you um, become in Christ? Mm. Mm. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a it's an outflow of of a, of a system of thinking. Um, to say that the elect is, uh, you know, is a is only those that 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 Christ uh, died for, um, you know, that's simply not true according to Scripture. Yeah, and it's also interesting to note that historically, I think Roger Olson uh, makes the comment in his book that when we look at the church fathers, we can see quite clearly in some. Uh, the, this is a, a statement from the church fathers, which is pretty general that the scope of salvation was always uh, universal. Uh, it was never limited to a group of people. Do you want to say anything about that historical reality um, and the reality of that which is evident to us in yeah. the Church Fathers? Look, an appeal to, to history or an appeal to the majority, you know, mm -hmm. um, as an argument is, is always um, problematic and, and maybe even fallacious. But, but, but it's interesting that, um, you know, to look at the, the early church and to see that they've, they've always um, looked at, at Scripture as, as, as being that, that Christ's atonement was, you know, was unlimited, that it was universal. So I think, <coughs> um, yeah, I think that's just, just an in in interesting ob observation and in that unless you project some of your um, systematic thinking onto Scripture, um, which is a you know a very strong later development development with with Augustine mm. uh, or Augustine, um, then you know the face face value reading of scripture is that the atonement, the atonement is for all people. How do you present the gospel to everyone as the gospel instructs us, if salvation is not really available to everyone? No, I don't. Think How do we do that? I don't think you can. You you can, um, no. <coughs> and I think. Um, <laughs> it really speaks to the love of God to um, to know that He's made provision for the sins of all people. Mm. Um, I just find it incomprehensible that God would be a partial or arbitrary um, a God who, you know, who elects for salvation only certain people. And that's not what I find in Scripture. Now, I know there's a whole systematic that says that is exactly what God does, but um, it seems to me God is less than, than loving and less than gracious um, when He does that. And, and mm. it, 
that does not mean that people deserve to be saved or deserve that God recon reconciled them to himself. That's not the issue. But God's nature is one of love. And um, he wants, he desires, Scripture says that, he desires all people to be saved and all to mm. come to repentance. Yeah, the interesting thing, though, is, is that, <coughs> you know, when that statement is made, they'll even try to, to say that, well, the all in that context is all the elect, you know. And when you read the context, you, you, you realize that that is not what the context is saying. But uh, getting Absolutely. back to, you know, the question of unbelievers and the fact that Christ died for sinners, um, how will somebody answer the question if they ask, for instance, a preacher, um, did Christ die for me? The preacher cannot sincerely say, yes, he did. Um, if he holds on to his perspective that God died only for some and not others, how does it impact the way in which they do evangelism? Because we know that, you know, in certain limitarian circles, mm. some of the greatest evangelists, some of the, <coughs> the historical uh, missionaries that have perpetrated and gone over to Africa, um, they were from this perspective, but yet they also held that Christ only died for the elect. So actually they went overseas only for the elect. Um, how do we deal with that? How, how do we answer that? How yeah, do we again, look at that? <coughs> again, you can't. Um, you can't um, look any specific person. I mean, you can make a general statement, but you can't uh, uh, look any specific person in the eye and mm. tell them God loves you and, and, and made provision for your, for your sins. Because you don't know, they because don't they, you don't know if they're elect. Um, so, yeah, it's a... <laughs> I've, um, heard, I've heard Calvinists say, well, Libertarians say the following. Um, D.A. Carson wrote a book on the love of God, and, mm. and, and, and he would be of the opinion, he would say, well, God loves you in a general sense, mm. a general sense of providence. So, in other words, he makes the sun shine over all men. Um, but then there is a specific love um, that we do not understand uh, and... That way. So, so if he would say, if somebody asks me, does God love me? His answer would obviously be yes. Uh, but I, I think that's a bit disingenuous that if you speak. completely disingenuous. I mean, <laughs> yeah, for the for most sure. important thing that... <coughs> for salvation. For, for salvation. Yeah. The most important thing in, in, in our whole human lives, God doesn't love you. You know, he loves you in a general sense. Mm. What, what, what is what a general is sense? If your purpose, you know for living is to glorify God and, 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 and to get to know Him. He doesn't want to get to know you. So, you know, you, how can you say that God loves you? The other question is also, <coughs> how can somebody be morally responsible for that which they cannot do? Um, they cannot repent. They cannot come to salvation because mm -hmm. God did not desire for him to do so. So, therefore, the individual is not really unrighteous, or am I saying it wrong? Well, I don't, I don't think... If you, if you can't desire things that, that um, well, let me put it this way, um, you, you can't help be held responsible for desires that was beyond your control. If you, mm -hmm. if you have certain desires and you cannot have other desires and you have no co control over that desire, then you cannot be held morally responsible for that. Now, that's a huge issue Absolutely. in, 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 you know, in um, Calvinistic thinking in itself. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically mm. what, I, what I think is true. Yeah, and if we look at the question from another perspective, maybe we can say that, you know, how does it impugn upon the character of God? Did he, um, you know, in a way generate faith in some and not in others? Um, and even if we look at it, um, you know, from another perspective, we might say, well, God in his foreknowledge uh, foresaw that the individual would deny the gift anyway, and he just leaves him. Uh, you know, in that state of, of depravity, if you want to say it like that. Uh, and therefore, he's not savable because God foreknows. But when I speak to the materials, it seems that for them, that is not a condition yeah. mm. uh, of the state the individual finds himself in. Yeah. It's just God's arbitrary will. Right. Uh, and, and can we deduce that God's got an arbitrary will and that God simply desires the salvation of some and not others? Um, that's not what we see in Scripture, is it? Yeah. No, uh, not. You know, uh, maybe... Maybe the question to ask is, what does it mean then when we say God <coughs> is love? We speak with John, 1 John chapter 4. Mm. He speaks quite clearly of that. How would you describe that love? Is it an all-encompassing mm. love? Is it a limited love? Is it a love that is only stated to some uh, that is made savable? Is there different states, states of love? Yeah. Uh, what will you say? Well, uh, again, I think, um, you know, the determinist, 
or libertarian has to define love in a different way than mm. than, than than we would normally um, think about it. And I just think love is 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 wanting the the the, the good of another person. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you know the ultimate good. I have, I have to put that. Love is wanting the ultimate good of another person. Mm. And what is the ultimate good in our situation when it comes to you know our eternal destiny? Yes. Um, it would be again to to know God and and to be reconciled to Him. Um, and I think um, you know to define love in in any other way would would detract from that. It would deny that. Mm. Um, so, so I take seriously that 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 God desires all to be saved because He is a God of love. Mm, yeah. I mean, and John three sixteen is so is so clear for me. I mean, it it, it it gets so muddled by this this whole debate about about the the atonement and and related issues. But f God so loved the world. I mean, that that says something about. About his heart. The, yeah, father's uh, heart. the interesting thing is, is when you read that passage a little bit further, I know a lot of people are only stopped by verse 16, mm. but if you read the rest, if you go to verse 18, 3, verse 18, you mm. can see quite clearly it's men that have rejected God, mm. uh, which have hardened their hearts against Him. You know, mm. And uh, it, it does not say that God hardened their hearts, it simply says they rejected God, yeah. which is very interesting. What would you say is probably, and uh, what would constitute, let me ask it this way, a valid offer of salvation for you? A valid offer of salvation is, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's one that, that reflects God's heart, um, His ability to, you know, to give it, our ability to receive it. Mm. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think those are some of the elements that, 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 that reflects that, it. yeah, that constitu constitutes that. Yeah. What would you say to somebody if they say, but you're just a, the only way for you to, to hold on to your view is this, you need to be a universalist. If you truly believe, you know, that God, uh, you know, died for all men and that God wants all men to be saved, mm. then the only conclusion should be, you know, that you're a universalist. What yeah. would you say to that individual? Look, <clears throat> I think we need to be also distinguish between atonement and redemption. Mm. Atonement is, is um, as I said in the beginning, a satisfaction for sin, for people's sins. And in that sense, it's, it's unlimited and universal. You know, um, Christ did make that satis satisfaction on the cross for people's sins. But then redemption is being actually delivered from sin. Mm. And that depends on a condition. What is that condition? To you know, to believe even even Calvinists would say that the condition um, for being re regenerated is belief. You know, mm. we, we we aren't regenerated apart from belief. So even in their own system, that is a condition. Um, so um, so I would just confirm that that um, you know, recon reconciliation is a is a is a relational term. Mm. There are two parties involved. God they took the initiative. Um, he's the one that died f f um, for us while we were ye yet sinners. So yes, he, he took yes. the initiative, and then he, he also draws us to him. Um, and we well, just need to respond in faith. Absolutely. And, and when you say respond to faith, obviously, I think a lot of libertarians believe that regeneration precedes faith. Uh, and for us, we would say, no, no, faith precedes regeneration. There needs to be a conditional uh, edifice from man. It doesn't mean man saves himself. Exactly. Uh, yeah. we, we can uphold Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and, uh, two, verse eight and 9. It says, by grace, we've been saved through faith. Right. Um, how would you explain that, though? What is the mechanism of, of this faith that is evoked by man? Is it generated by the individual themselves? Because libertarians will then say, well, then you <coughs> say that you've saved yourself and you cannot uphold mm. a scripture like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Well, faith is just a, a response. It's an um, it's a act of trust. Yes. It's recognizing that you can actually do nothing um, to save yourself. Mm. So it's mm. a, in itself, trust is that rec recognition of I'm totally dependent on the object of my trust. 
So, mm -hmm. so, but it is, it is an act of man. It is something that I must do. Um, so I, I've never understood the idea of, of, of being given faith as, as, as if faith is something that, that can be given to somebody else. Mm. You cannot give trust to somebody else. It's, it's something that you do as a response. So it's not a, it's not a work, you know. So um, you don't save yourself by doing the work of faith. Mm, yeah, for sure. Um, it is an act of trust, just a response to say, I acknowledge that I, that I can't save myself. Yeah, and then again, we need to acknowledge as <coughs> well that, you know, a lot of people would say, yes, yes, uh, it is an act, you know, that, that is obviously generated in the individual. But, but in doing so, it, it, it degenerates the salvific work and the glory of God. Um, but I don't think so. I think in a way, as you've just explained, it, it upholds the glory of God, that God can save individuals where they are at. Um, just in that, you know, maybe if we speak about this valid offer of salvation, maybe you can share uh, just quickly with the audience. Uh, you know, somebody might be out there. They might say, I've always had this drawing towards God, um, you know, which is obviously not natural, mm. you know, but I've been told, uh, you know, that I'm dead in my trespasses and sin, and therefore I'm passively waiting for God to save me mm. uh, because that's what I was taught in church. What would you say to individuals that believe that they are so dead in their trespasses and sin that they can have no interaction or reaction towards God? And in a way, they are still waiting for God to save them. Yeah. Well, I, I think the fact that you realize you're, you're so dead in your sin is a, is a work of God. That's what yeah. He does. He draws us. He wants to make us aware. You know, John, John 16 verse 8 to 11 talks about the Holy Spirit's uh, ministry to to all people, to unbelievers, and yeah. one of them is to make the, make us aware of of our deadness in sin. Yeah. So, so if you are aware of that, you're not as dead as you thought. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and and you can respond to that. Yeah, for sure. By just accepting what the word says about your need to believe. Yeah, and and, and again, like I said, in some of our brothers, they believe that being dead means that there is. There's nothing that, that you can do. There's m no moral culpability. There is, there's no understanding or recognition of light or grace uh, that is brought on mm. our behalf. Um, lastly, why can you have a clear conscience say that salvation and grace is offered to all men? Can you say that? I can because I think that is what, what Scripture teaches. Mm. Um, and, and, and that is my understanding of who God is in His love, that He... Um, that he desires all people to be saved, that none should perish, mm. that he's made provision for, for all people's sin on the cross, for the whole world, mm. you know, uh, 1 John 2 verse 2, um, that he has um, no pleasure in the wicked dying, that he wants people to turn from their sins and live. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, is Ezekiel 18 verse 23, and that he wants all people to come to repentance, Acts seventeen thirty. And that's sure. that's that's where my confidence lies, and and why I can in in a good conscience say this about the extent of God's loving atonement. This is a bit of a loaded question, but would you say that men perish and go to hell because they deny God, or because God denied them? <laughs> <laughs> God, God doesn't deny anybody. It's because people reject God. Um, there's many scripture that, that, that holds people accountable for rejecting the truth and, and, um, and the knowledge of God. Mm. Um, he wants them to have that knowledge and he wants them to accept the truth. And that's why he accuses them of denying that and rejecting that, not because he will withholds it from them. How would you share the gospel of someone from this perspective? What would you say to somebody if you share with them um, how would you lead them, uh, if you want to say, to the Lord? Um, yeah, I would, I would, I would just um, confirm the, 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 the essentials of, of the gospel. That um, you know, I think John three sixteen is you know is the is the paradigm um, way of of talking to somebody about about the gospel. Um, and, and explain the elements of that, mm. um, God's, God's love um, for them, 
their desperate need of a saviour because of their sins. Um, Christ's provision for that on the cross um, and, and the result of that. Um, the one is a warning and the other one is a promise. You know, if you, if you don't believe, um, you will perish. If you do, you will have eternal life. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, I think for anybody listening to this today, you know, uh, what would you say to somebody if they say, but I've got no desire. Uh, do I step out in faith and say, Lord, here I am. I do not understand the merit of everything, but, but where do I start? Where do I start today in this journey towards you? Yeah, I think, I think as, you, as you rightly says, it's, it's, it's uh, maybe just a, a step in faith and say, I, I, I acknowledge that I don't understand. Mm. Because I, I do think um, that if we humble ourselves, that God meets us. In fact, He's already there. He's already reached out to us. Amen. And our hesitance, you know, as sinners, um, is often just uh, our feelings, you know, playing, playing tricks on us. Mm. And so it is often just a matter of accepting the truth and, and stepping out in, in faith and say, um, my feelings don't correspond, but um, this, this is what I see as the truth being presented and I'm going to act on that and that act of faith um, might, might just be what that person needs and, and then the feelings might change. Amen. Maybe we, we don't usually do this but maybe we can end the session off uh, maybe you can pray uh, just maybe if there's somebody out mm. there that, that is really I know somebody that you know said to me they've um, well, th they say they, fe they, they cannot be a Christian because they feel they've been in a specific denomination and group and they feel that they, they've not been elected. Mm. And therefore, they're not, they, they mm. might just as well die and be a sinner and hope yeah. that one day, this guy actually is funny because he says, hopefully when I die and go to hell, um, hopefully, you know, there is, uh, he, he doesn't hold to conditional mortality. So he says, hopefully there'll be a destruction in the end and I'll just cease to exist. Mm. That is my hope. My hope is not to cross. Yeah. Um, maybe we can pray for individuals struggling with this. Sure. Uh, and maybe this will set them free in seeing that God is a God of love and he truly extended an yeah. offer to individuals yeah. uh, which they can hold on to and believe Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Yeah, will you pray. end for us and pray? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that we can just fall back on your word and, and just acknowledge the truth of what you say. Um, that you truly love us and that we can see that in the historical event of, of Jesus dying on a cross so many years ago. And although we often have feelings and excuses for, for why this seems distant and we, we cannot apply it to our own lives, we, we recognize that that those are just feelings and mm -hmm. we need something solid. And so we turn back on, on Scripture, um, just the truth of, of what you say in Scripture, that, that you love me as an individual, that you have died for me as an individual by name, and that I can know that I have eternal life as, as 1, John 15, uh, 1 John 5 also says. Yes. Um, that I can know that I have eternal life um, by believing that Christ died for my sins on the cross. Um, and I just pray that, that any person listening here who struggles with this doubt will make that truth their own just by believing it, mm. accepting, accepting that this is what Scripture says. And let that sink in and let the Holy Spirit work. And, and we trust that you will work and change the feelings and, and give us confidence, give the person confidence who's, who, who's doubting that they are a child of God because of what you did. Amen. We thank you for, for knowing this and that you love us. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks, Udo. Um, and uh, we'll probably get you back again in the future. But thank you so much thank for you. your time. Thank you, Rudolf.